we should probably clear that up. So here's here's the difference between a B film and an exploitation film. And an A film, even. So an A film is what you see in movie theaters. It's, you know, Hollywood productions. It's stuff that's distributed through all the major media platforms. So those are A films. A B film is a historical oddity. It's from the 20th century when feature films were packaged with a buddy film, (laughs) a second feature, to create a longer program in the movie theater. Thus, the movie theater owner can charge a little bit more money. And the math always worked out where you made more money that way. You made more money if you had a good B picture because then you have you double the odds of people seeing the movie and um, it takes up more time and people are paying more for a longer duration of entertainment and bada bada bada. There's all these reasons because of the way that you hide costs from the B film and, and all this stuff. So that's a B film. There's plenty of Cuban sugar though. Here's what happened. The general beat his friend Castro to the Cuban treasury. The strong box is now on this boat. So are a deported American gangster and his mall. And lurking in the depths is the creature from the haunted sea. You're a crazy mixed up kid. I am perfectly adjusted to my life of crime. Don't worry, Mary Bell. I'll save you. All right, be calm, everybody. The boat's insured. So a lot of the major companies had B-unit productions, like RKO, for example. Um, they had a producer under in, in RKO called Val Luton, and he made some of the greatest <laughs> B-films ever. Uh, he's just amazing. I recommend everybody see, like, I Walked With a Zombie or um, Cat People. I mean, there's really no other movie quite like them. And he made that in the B, you know, as a B filmmaker, which means that he couldn't build any new sets. He had to use only existing sets from A pictures, from A films. He had to work with a title that was given to him. He couldn't pick one. And he had only a certain amount of days and a certain limited budget to work under. Um, And he had to pick, I believe, from the RKO cast. You know, he had those limitations. And it was like, other than that, write your screenplay, make it good, you know. You're a B film. So th- those are B films. B films are cheap movies made by major productions. Uh, now, often there were independent companies that would make B films as well. And just like anything else, the major companies would purchase or license the B films made by independent companies and package those with their A pictures. So that's a B film. Now, as, as terms of aesthetically, B films are constrained at this time by the production code and by just the general taste. You know, a, a major brand like the Warner Brothers, they're not going to distribute a movie um, if it's in poor taste and makes their company look bad. A film or B film. So they're very dependent on public taste and persona. And obviously, at the time, legally, well, to self, it was a self-regulation, but you know, quote unquote, legally by the production code. <sighs> okay, an exploitation film is a movie that's it's a 20th century phenomenon. It's still going on today, however, but it started around this time in the 30s and 40s, late 20s, 30s, and 40s and went off into the 50s. The period, according to this book, is 1919 through 1959 is the era of the original classic exploitation film. And so, to define it, an exploitation film is a cheaply made, independent product film whose primary spectacle 
is considered forbidden or taboo by the major film production companies. Herschel Gordon Lewis defined it to me as it's the kind of movies that Hollywood could not or would not make. That's an exploitation film. So <clears throat> the difference between a B film and an exploitation film is that a B film is is made to be officially accepted by the various distribution channels, the movie theater network and stuff like that. Um, they're distributed by major companies often. And an exploitation film was often distributed via road show, like a carnival style road show uh, at drive-in theaters or independent places. Um, or they would book a movie theater, a local movie theater for a one time, like limited weekend or week long one spot, you know, exhibition of their movie. And uh, exploitation films were often the result of very resilient, independent, um, savvy entrepreneurs. They weren't filmmakers. They were like like ruthless carnival folk. <laughs> you know, uh, they saw that the public had a taste for something, that Hollywood was unwilling to cross a certain boundary because of public tastes and public perception. And because they're constrained by the by the Hayes Code, exploiteers didn't give a fuck <laughs> about the Hayes Code. Um, you know, they would be like, "You can't show this movie," and they're like, "Well, what are you gonna do?" And they're like, "We're gonna shut you down by Wednesday." And he's like, "All right, fine. I'm gonna be out of here by Sunday. So <laughs> go for it." And that's what would happen. He would cash in. The exploiter will will cash in from the ticket sales. That's something to talk about as well, how they got their ticket sales and how they made their money. It's a very interesting story. I've read multiple books about this subject. And um, Herschel Gordon Lewis is actually a mentor of mine. He lives in the same city. And we get together every few months to talk about, you know, what the good old days of Miami exploitation filmmaking was like. <laughs> and he's got some crazy stories. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the difference between a B-film and an exploitation film, basically. Um, a B-film is driven by narrative, storytelling, just cheap storytelling. An exploitation film is driven by spectacle, scenes that give you the goods, basically. If you paid money <laughs> to see uh, a hygiene film, like a like a birth of a baby movie during the 1940s. You're there to see footage of a baby coming out of a woman's vagina on 35 millimeter, very big. And everything else is just filler to pad the duration of the movie so you feel that you were justified in paying a few bucks to see the movie. Because you wouldn't pay a few bucks to see, you know, just that short film that would be perverted. <laughs> you have to create an illusion of a story. Um, so that's why exploitation movies, their stories are kind of like dreamlike and they don't really make sense. Because they're just cobbled together. Often it's like an exploitation film will be 50%, well maybe not 50, but a high percentage, 20% stock footage from a movie from like the 1920s with new footage from stuff from the 40s. And you're just like, what? Like it doesn't make sense. Like one shot is from the 20s. The reverse shot is from 20 years later. Um so that, or if you were to pay money to see uh, an exotic exploitation film, as it was called, uh, you would expect, with a big wink from the poster, to see naked, boob-out native women. <laughs> that's, that's what you're there for. And maybe a man in a gorilla costume running around chasing them so they wave their arms in the air and they jiggle and it's like, this is an anthropological survey of the native women, you know. So, okay, so we're, we're tracing this, this thing, right? We're tracing this motherfucker. So, 
The deep note of the tom-tom has called in these savages from all over the island for this ceremony. And deep in the jungle they have clearings called Sing Sing Grounds, where they hold their hideous feasts. The cannibal woman is not permitted to eat human flesh, but she prepares it for cooking. One of these ceremonies starts with a dance, early in the morning. It starts in an orderly manner. But as the hours go by, the men become frenzied. They tear their hair, they scream like demons, tear off their covering, if any, and they dance until they fall exhausted. They're kicked out of the way and others take their places. The whole spectacle is a very disgusting and revolting one to a white man.